You can do it if you believe you can. Hi, everyone. In this video, I would like to go through the following major topics. Number one, solve by factoring. Number two, solve by completing the square. Number three, solve using the quadratic formula. Number four, solve for x and y. Number five, find the maximum or minimum. And of course, number six, word problems. Now, before we begin, I would like to invite you into three possible frameworks. As we're navigating through some of these examples and you're taking notes with um, your pencil and paper and so on, you can give yourself one of the three feedbacks. Number one, you understand. So give yourself a check mark indicating that you fully understand the example that we're going to go through in a moment. Case number two, you have no idea what is going on. So you can put an X to remind yourself to go back to this question and try again and again and again. And of course, option number three, sometimes you kind of get it, but you don't get it completely yet. Put a question mark there to remind yourself to get a refresher, to get closer to the first case, which is basically you understand this. Let's begin. Example number one, solve by factoring. 1a, x squared divided by 4 plus x plus 1 equals to 0. So the first step is you look at the denominator and you recognize it's a 4. And in order to think about the opposite of dividing by 4, you can multiply the left-hand side and the right-hand side by 4. So on the left-hand side, you have 4 times open bracket, x squared divided by 4 plus x plus 1, which equals to, on the right-hand side, 4 times 0. And again, I'm going to promote mental math throughout the entire video. If you would like to use a simple calculator to confirm, that's fine. I'm going to draw the arrows. Again, I'm inviting every student to draw these arrows. It helps you stay organized, and you're getting closer to 100%. 4 times x squared divided by 4 is going to be x squared plus 4 times x, plus 4 times 1 is going to be 4. On the right-hand side, 4 times 0 is going to give you 0. Now again, the question says solve by factoring. So you go back and you look at the left-hand side, x squared plus 4x plus 4. And you can think about this from a perfect square perspective. So this is really x plus 2 quantity squared, which equals to 0. The opposite of squaring something is to find the square root. So for your reference, I'll grab a different color. When you are finding the square root, by the way, there are two cases, plus or minus. But since you're looking at plus or minus of nothing, it's going to be nothing. So it's going to be x plus 2, which equals to 0, x equals to negative 2. Now, before we move forward, this is where I'm going to invite you to double check. Double check will help you get 100% every single time. And double check takes about one minute, and it looks something like this. You basically look at the answer, and you want to find out, is this the right answer? So you take x equal to negative 2. You're going to plug it back to the original question on the left-hand side. So if you write down ls, which means left-hand side, I plug in negative 2 for x. And my goal is to work this out, and I need to know, does this give me the same answer as the right-hand side? If it does, you got 100%. If it doesn't, you go back and you try again. So again, if you look at the left-hand side, negative 2 squared, that's 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1. Minus 2 plus 1, that's exactly 0. So by spending less than 60 seconds to double check, that's the best feeling I can offer you, knowing that you got 100% right after doing this question. Example 1b, x squared divided by 2 minus x divided by 3 minus 1 divided by 6 equal to 0. So again, I would like to invite you to try this by yourself. You can pause the video. When you press play again, I'll be here. Welcome back, everybody. So the first step is you have to find a common denominator. And by inspection, it says 2, 3, and 6. And the common denominator is going to be 6. So again, you're going to multiply both sides by the common denominator. On the left-hand side, you're going to have 6 times in brackets, x squared divided by 2 minus x divided by 3 minus 1 divided by 6, which equals to, on the right-hand side, 6 times 0. Again, draw the arrows. When you expand the left-hand side, 6 times x squared divided by 2 is going to be 3x squared minus 6 divided by 3 is going to be 2, so that's going to be 2x 
And of course, six times one divided by six, in this case, will give you negative one. On the right-hand side, six times zero is gonna give you zero. Let's keep going. Now, you have to be mindful when it comes to factoring, there are many methods. And to avoid the paradox of choice, we're gonna show you one possible way. Think about 3x squared. That's gonna be 3x times x. Think about the factors of negative one, one and negative one. Your goal is to find a sum of negative two. So in this case, you can think of, for example, one minus three. So one minus three is gonna give you uh, negative two. So there's one and there's negative three. And if you solve for x here, again, in the first bracket, notice three x plus one, that's gonna give you zero. 3x is going to give you negative 1. x equals to negative 1 over 3. Likewise, if you look at the second bracket, x minus 1 is going to give you 0. x equals to 1. Now again, I'm going to erase some of the work here. I hope you're copying it down. Don't eyeball this video. Really go through it with a piece of paper and a pencil. And I'm going to show you how to get 100% spend that one extra minute, you're gonna double check. And you're gonna do this twice. So for example, I can start with one, I'm gonna plug it back to the left-hand side. So the left-hand side equals to one square divided by two minus one over three minus one over six. And if you do this right, we should get exactly the same as the right-hand side. Are you ready? Half minus one third, the common denominator again is gonna be six. So what you, what you can do is multiply the first fraction by three over three, the second fraction by two over two, and of course, it should not be a surprise that 3 minus 2 minus 1 is going to be 0, which when you divide by 6, will still give you 0, which is exactly the right-hand side. You do this again, except this time we're checking x equal to negative 1 over 3. So in this case, it's going to be negative 1 over 3, quantity squared, divided by 2, minus negative 1 over 3, divided by 3, minus 1 over 6. Now again, if you think about this, I'm going to invite you with a little bit of mental math. Negative one over three squares one over nine. One over nine divided by two is one over 18. If you look at the next part, negative negative is gonna be positive. One over three divided by three is gonna be one over nine, which is two over 18. And of course, if you think about one over six, you can multiply this by three over three. So minus three over 18, which again, one plus two minus three is gonna give you zero. When you divide, zero with uh, or zero divided by 18 is going to give you exactly zero so again now you have the power to get 100 percent, and it's a choice that you must make example 2a solve by completing the square so for 2a the question says 0.1 g square minus 0.3 g plus 0.5 which equals to zero here's the first step factor 0.1 Again, when we say factoring, we do not factor the constant. So the plus 0.5, you can copy as is. When you go back to the brackets, 0.1 times g squared will give you 0.1 g squared. Now, this is the part I'm going to slow down, and I need you to write this down. If this helps you, write it down. How do we know what the next number is? It's always going to be the middle term, which is negative 0.3, divided by the leading coefficient, which is 0.1. So again, if you think about this, that's the same as saying negative 3 divided by 1, which is negative 3. So if you go back, you can write down minus 3g. Now, if you want to double check quickly, you can kind of go back and say, what is 0 0.1 times negative 3g? Well, that's negative 0.3g. That's how we kind of confirm that we're doing it right. Now, the next part is going to be dividing by 2 and squaring it. So specifically, I'm looking at the number negative three. Now, if you took negative three or if you took three, the answer actually doesn't change, but I'm going to grab negative three. So in this case, when you take negative three and you square this, or I should say divide by two first, that's going to give you negative three divided by two. When you square this, that's going to be nine divided by four. So now you're adding and you're subtracting nine divided by four, just like that. Now, if you're doing this right, every single time, 100% of the time, you will get a perfect square. If you don't get a perfect square, you have to go back and try this again. So this is going to give you 0.1. I'm going to put some brackets here. I'm copying everything else. Again, think about g squared minus 3g plus 9 divided by 4. That's basically 
open bracket, g minus 3 divided by 2 quantity square. Now again, how do we factor this? There are two methods. But to avoid the paradox of choice, here's what I'm going to suggest for everybody. You take the square root of g squared, that's g. You take the square root of 9 divided by 4, that's going to be 3 over 2, and you copy, in this case, the negative sign. And of course, that becomes a square. Again, expand this by drawing the arrows. This is going to give you value every single time. Now notice here we have fractions, we have decimals, so maybe I'll add one more step for you. We don't want you to be um, unclear with the decimal and fraction. Sometimes this is confusing. So what you can do is you can add this baby step, recognizing that 0.1 is 1 over 10. Again, I'm copying everything else. And likewise, 0 0.5 is the same as 1 divided by 2. So now if I draw the arrows again, we can expand this and we think about this in terms of a fraction. So 1 divided by 10 times g minus 3 over 2 quantity square. When you take 1 divided by 10 and you multiply this with negative 9 over 4, that's negative 9 divided by 40. You're going to add half, which equals to 0. Your goal is to combine this as one fraction. And the common denominator for 40 and 2 is going to be 40. So you're going to multiply this by 20 over 20. Again, negative 9 plus 20, that's going to be 11. So I'm going to erase this to save a bit of space. Actually, you know what? I'll erase it after. I'm going to keep going here in case you're still copying. So 1 over 10 times g minus 3 over 2, quantity squared. So 20 minus 9 is going to be 11, so plus 11 over 40, which equals to 0. Now, your goal is to solve by completing the square. So you have to bring this to the other side. So 1 divided by 10 times g minus 3 over 2 quantity square equals to negative 11 over 40. Now, I can already kind of see how there are no real roots just because it's a negative number, which we'll demonstrate after. So again, the opposite of dividing by 10 is to multiply by 10. So on the left-hand side, if you multiply by 10, it's going to be g minus 3 over 2 quantity square. And I'll write this out for you. So I'm multiplying by 10 on both sides. On the right-hand side, 10 divided by 40 is going to be 1 divided by 4. That's going to give you negative 11 divided by 4. So now, if you look at this carefully, the opposite of squaring something is to find the square root. And there are two cases, plus or minus. But you cannot find the square root of a negative number. So for this question, I think the answer is going to be no real roots. And we're going to give you a little bit more. So first of all, the final answer is going to be no real roots. But again, I would like to invite you to a dual mindset, meaning how do we know for sure this is the answer? Sometimes we solve a question and we don't really know if it works. And we did talk about double checking, but when it comes to a case where there's no solution, you can't really double check because there's no solution. So what I am going to say is if you graph this, it's probably going to be above the x-axis. So again, it's not a perfect graph, but it's going to open up and it's probably going to look something like that. And because it's going to be above the x-axis, it never crosses the x-axis. Therefore, there are no answers. Example 2b, 1 divided by 4, n squared plus n equals to negative 1 divided by 8. Again, I would like to invite you to try this. You can pause the video. When you're done and you press play again, I'll be here. Welcome back. So here's the solution for example 2b. Again, the first step is you're thinking about the denominators 4 and 8. And the common denominator is going to be 8. So maybe I'll start on this side this time so there's more space. I'm going to multiply the left-hand side and the right-hand side by 8. And the reason is because we're trying to get rid of the denominators. So again, not to overstate this, draw the arrows. You can even draw an arrow like that on the right-hand side. When you look at 8 times 1 divided by 4, that's going to be 2. So 2n squared plus 8n, which equals to negative 1. So by inspection, the question was a little bit challenging. But because you multiplied both sides by the common denominator, the question is now a lot less uh, intense. You bring it back to the left, 2n squared plus 8n 
plus one equals to zero. Again, we go back to solve by completing the square. Step one, you factor the leading coefficient, which is two. So in this case, again, we don't factor the constant. So the plus one can copy as is. In the brackets, two times n squared is two n squared. How do we know what the next number is? Again, just in case you didn't copy this in the previous case, you always take the middle number, eight. You divide this by the leading coefficient, which is two. And eight divided by two is gonna be four. So again, it's gonna be four n. How do we know? Two times four n is eight n. Then you take this number, divide by two and you square it. For your reference, I'll grab a different color. You take four, you divide it by two, which is gonna be two. You take two square, which is gonna be four. So you're adding and you're subtracting four. If you're doing it right, you will always, every single time, 100% of the time, get a perfect square. Copy the two, open the bracket, you copy everything else first. And again, n square plus 4n plus 4 becomes n plus 2 quantity square. How do we know that? You go back, you take the square root of n square, that's n, you take the square root of 4, that's going to be 2, and you copy the plus sign. And of course, there's a square there. Let's erase some of this. I'm going to continue the next column for you. And again, if possible, we'll demonstrate how to, how to double check. So if we expand this, 2 times n plus 2, quantity square, minus 4 plus 1, which equals to 0. Negative 8 plus 1 is going to be negative 7. I copy everything else. If you bring negative 7 to the right-hand side, that's going to be positive 7. I still copy 2 times n plus 2, quantity square. The opposite of multiplying by 2 is to divide by 2. So I'm going to divide by 2 here, and here I can cross it out. The opposite of squaring something is to find the square root. Again, be mindful, there are two cases, plus and minus. Now, we're going to express the final answer in exact form, and uh, we can even round it to one decimal place. We'll show you both. So on the left-hand side, you end up with n plus 2, which equals to plus and minus square root of 7 over 2. So n equals to negative 2 plus or minus square root of 7 over 2. First of all, if you are looking at the denominator, there's a root 2. And you can multiply both root 7 and root 2 by root 2 over root 2. So effectively, you're multiplying it by 1. You're not changing the value, but you're changing the form. So in exact form, n is going to be negative 2 plus or minus root 14 divided by 2. Now, if you round this to one decimal, let's work this out. So again, with a simple calculator, you can do this because a simple calculator has a square root function. So if you have your calculator with you, let's try this together here and now. So I'm going to grab a calculator. I'm going to press the square root of 14. I'm dividing this by 2, and I'm subtracting 2. So one answer here, n, is going to be negative 0 0.1, You can round this to one decimal place. So for example, 0 0.1 approximately. Now the second answer, of course, is I take the square root of 14. I still divide this by 2, except this is negative, And I subtract this by negative 2. So the other answer is going to be negative 3.87082863. If I round this to one decimal place, it's going to be approximately negative 3.9. Again, most students, they stop here. And that's fine, but I'm going to show you again how to get 100%. You plug this back to the left-hand side. Now, be mindful. You're not going to get exactly the right-hand side because this is an approximation. So we're not expecting to get 0 0.000, but we are expecting something very close to it. So, for example, if I plug negative 0 0.1, I can grab a calculator. I press 0 0.1 times negative 0 0.1 quantity square minus 0.3 times negative 0 0.1, and I'm adding it with uh, 0 0.5. Now, let me just do this again on my calculator. Let me double check again. 0 0.1 times negative 0.1 square minus 0 0.3 times 
negative 0.1 plus 0.5. Now, let me double check with uh, one more two of them. One moment. Now, before I continue, I recognize I did not plug this number back into the correct side. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to erase this. Let's try this one more time. So we found the answers. And of course, let me circle the question that we're focusing on. We're going to plug this back in on the correct left-hand side. So let's try this again. 1 divided by 4 times negative 0.1 square plus negative 0.1. I'm going to try this one more time. So 1 divided by 4 times negative 0.1. I square this minus 0.1. So again, this is not exactly zero, but it's close enough. So this is how you can tell that the first answer makes sense. I repeat the same process. I'm going to plug in. Actually, it's not even zero. I should be more clear about this. We should be getting a number that's very close to the right-hand side. And the right-hand side is actually negative 1 divided by 8. So this should be negative 0.125. So let's write down approximately negative 1 over 8. Again, it's not exactly negative 1 over 8, but it's fairly close. Now, again, if I plug in the second case, uh, negative 3.9, that's going to be 1 over 4, times negative 3.9 square plus negative 3.9. Let's try this one more time. So 1 divided by 4, I multiply by negative 3.9. I square this minus 3.9. And again, this is roughly the same as the right-hand side. It's not exactly the right-hand side, but it's uh, it's close enough. Example number three, solve using the quadratic formula. In part A, the question says 2x squared equals to 11. Now, the first step is to bring it to one side. So 2x squared minus 11 equals to zero. Again, I'm inviting everybody to add this one step. This is going to support you to understand why everything makes sense. So for your reference, I'm grabbing a different color. Notice there's no x in this left-hand side. So you're going to add an empty parameter. Just write plus and zero x. And again, the reason is because you can now identify the values of a, b, and c. So for example, a, that's going to be 2. b, that's going to be 0. And c is going to be negative 11. Again, the quadratic formula, x equals to negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. We go back, we plug in b, so negative 0 plus or minus square root, 0 squared minus 4 times 2 times negative 11 divided by 2 times 2. We're going to work this out. So if you look at the first part, that's going to be 0 plus or minus. If you look at what's inside the square root, that's going to be 4 times 2, which is 8. 8 times 11 is going to be 88. So square root of 88 divided by 4. Now you have to be mindful. You have to look at the square root of 88, and you want to reduce this to the following. So think of a perfect square. So for example, 88 is the same as saying 4 times 22. And you can divide this by 4. So x equals 2, and it's a plus or minus sign, of course. And the square root of 4 is going to be 2. So plus or minus 2, root 22 divided by 4. 2 divided by 4 is going to be half. So it's going to be plus or minus root 22 divided by 2. Now, let's double check to make sure this makes sense. Plus or minus root 22 over 2. No, this makes sense. So again, how do we know if we're doing this right? You can go back and double check. So again, by spending that one extra minute, I'm going to show you on the left top corner here what to do. So on the left-hand side, if you plug in two times, in the first case, uh, root 22 divided by 2, quantity square, look what happens. This is going to be 2 times 22 divided by 4. And of course, 2 divided by 4 is half. 22 divided by 2 is 11, exactly the same as the right-hand side. So that's a good sign. Likewise, you can try the negative case. But of course, if I just grab a different color, the negative case will still give you the same thing. Because when you square a negative number, it will still give you that positive 11 at the end. So again, by double checking, 
That's the best feeling I can offer you. Feeling confident while you're doing this within that window. Example 3B, x divided by 2 plus 1 equals to 7x squared divided by 2. Again, please try this. You can pause the video when you're done and you press play again. I'll be here. Welcome back, everybody. So here's the first step. You can bring everything to one side. Now, because 7x squared divided by 2 is on the right, I'm going to bring everything to the right. So 7x squared divided by 2 minus x divided by 2 minus 1. Now, it does say solve using the quadratic formula. But notice there's a fraction here. So you can always choose to multiply both sides, in this case, by 2, so that you can work with uh, numbers or you, should, you can work with integers instead of a fraction. So 2 times 0 is going to be 0. Again, you can draw the arrows like that. 7 over 2 times 2 is going to be 7 times x squared, so 7x squared. Half times 2 is 1, so this is going to be negative x. Negative 1 times 2 is going to be negative 2. Now, for some students, they're going to look at this, and they find it's very confusing because the zero is on the left-hand side. So again, if that's what you're experiencing, you can always write down 7x squared minus x minus 2 equal to 0, just like that. Again, here's the quadratic formula. x equals to negative b plus the minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a, and you can plug it back in. Now, notice this time, I'm expecting you to see the values of abc are 7, negative 1, and negative 2. So for example, here, you're going to write negative, negative 1, plus or minus square root of negative 1 squared minus 4 times 7 times negative 2 divided by 2 times 7. Again, if you look at what's inside the uh, square root, that's going to be 1 plus 4 times 2 is 8, 8 times 7 is going to be 56. So you're not going to get a perfect square, and that's OK. So it's going to be 1 plus or minus square root of, again, that's 1 plus 56 to 57 divided by 14. Now, I'm also going to round this to one decimal place. So if your goal is to ex leave in exact form, that's the answer. But if your goal is to leave it to one decimal place, again, if you take the square root of 57, plus 1 divided by 14, that's going to be approximately 0 0.6. Now, in the display, I see 0 0.6, In the second case, if I take the square root of 57, which is negative, by the way, add it to 1 divided by 14, this is going to be approximately negative 0 0.5. But really, it's negative 0 0.46784 so if you want to confirm that you did it right, again, you can plug these numbers back in. So this time, I'm going to plug the first one, and you can try the second one on your own, and hopefully you'll get the same answer as well. So on the left-hand side here, that's going to be 0.6 divided by 2 plus 1. So if you work that out, that's going to be 0.6 divided by 2 is 0.3, that's 1.3. If you look at the right-hand side, the 7 over 2 times 0.6 squared, and again, if you work it out, 0.6 square times point, or not point, but 7 over 2, which is 3.5, that's going to be equal to 1.26. So 1.26 is approximately 1.3. So this is still a confirmation you did it right, because our answer is rounded. So you're not going to get perfectly 1.3 for both sides. Again, I'm going to leave it up to you if you want to choose to double check to feel confident that you got 100% for this example. Example number four, determine the points of intersection of each pair of functions. f of x equals to negative 2, x squared minus 5x plus 20, and g of x equals to 6x minus 1. So again, when you think about this, there are a couple of cases you want to think about. Sometimes you can have two answers, sometimes you can have one answer, and sometimes there are no answers. Let's try this. Now, even though we're expressing it as f of x and g of x, just write down y. So the best way to think about this is just write down y equals to y. And to be clear, what I really mean is f of x equals to g of x. 
and f of x is going to be negative 2, x squared minus 5x plus 20. On the right, g of x is going to be 6x minus 1. So again, your goal is to solve for x. And sometimes you cannot solve this. There are no solutions. Sometimes there's one solution. Sometimes there are two solutions. Just be open-minded before you, you keep going. Now again, I'm going to bring it to the left-hand side. So negative 2x squared. If you bring 6x to the left-hand side, negative 6 minus 5 is going to be negative 11x. If you bring negative 1 to the left-hand side, that's going to be 21 equal to 0. At this point, you have a choice. You can solve by factoring. You can solve using the quadratic formula. You can solve using completing the square. The one method that works every single time is going to be the quadratic formula. So normally, I would say solve by factoring, then go to the quadratic formula. But in this case, I'm going to jump straight to the formula. So x equals to negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Again, this is going to be negative, negative 11 plus or minus square root negative 11 square minus 4 times negative 2 times 21 divided by 2 times negative 2. If I'm thinking about what's inside the square root, let's see what happens. This turns out to be a perfect square. So again, x equals to positive 11 plus or minus. Now if you take negative 11 square, minus 4 times negative 2 times 21. That's going to be the square root of 289. You divide this by negative 4. Again, if you keep going, the square root of 289 is going to be 17. So now there are two cases. In the first case, that's going to be 11 plus 17 divided by negative 4. In the second case, it's going to be 11 minus 17 divided by negative 4. So if I go back to the first case, that's going to be 11 plus 17. That's 28. Divide that by negative 4. That's going to be negative 7. In the second case, you're going to take 11 minus 17. Divide that by negative 4. And it's going to be 1.5. So if you want to leave it as a decimal, that's perfectly fine. Now, that's not the answer. The question is asking you specifically for the points of intersection. So it's not asking what is x. It's asking x, y. So you have to go back and plug it in. Now, the fastest method to plug it in is to go back to g of x. So again, you could plug it back to f of x. You could plug it back to g of x. But I would say the fastest approach is to go back and say, in the first case, 4x equal to negative 7. y equals to 6 times negative 7 minus 1. So now, if you think about this point, it's going to be negative 7. Now, 6 times negative 7 is negative 42. Minus 1 is negative 43. So there's the first point of intersection. In the second column, if you think about x equal to 1.5, again, you can plug it back to the second case, 6 times 1.5 minus 1. 6 times 1.5 is going to be 9. 9 minus 1 is going to be 8. So the second POI, the point of intersection, is going to be 1.5 and 8 just like that. Now, the bonus step, which I invite you to think about, is you can graph this. If you graph this uh, straight line, 6x minus 1, and you graph the parabola, which opens down, negative 2x squared minus 5x plus 20, you would discover it crosses at those two POIs. Example number five, find the maximum or minimum value of each of the following. So again, there are two ways of doing this. And the second method is a shortcut I'm going to show you. But here's the first approach, completing the square. Again, the first step is to factor negative 1 over 3. Notice we do not factor the plus 4 at the end. We just copy it as is. In the brackets, negative 1 over 3 times x squared is going to be negative 1 over 3 x squared. How do we know what the next number is? Again, not to overstate this, you take the middle number, which is 2, and you divide it by the leading coefficient. Now, again, I'm going to invite you with a little bit of uh, mental math. If you want to grab a calculator, I understand that. But 2 is the same as 2 over 1. And 2 over 1 divided by negative 1 over 3 is going to be 2 over 1 multiplied by 3 over negative 1. So this is going to give you negative 6. Again, it's going to be negative 6x if you want to double check. Negative 1 over 3 times negative 6x will give you 
2x, which means you did it right. Again, you take this number, negative 6, you divide it by 2. Then you take that number and you square it. When you do, you're adding and you're subtracting by 9. To confirm you're doing it right, every single time, 100% of the time, you will always get a perfect square. So I copy everything else. And if I go back now, again, x squared minus 6x plus 9, this is going to be x minus 3 quantity squared. I'm not going to draw the arrows this time. If you've been watching the video up to this point, I hope you can do the mental math with me. This is going to be negative 1 over 3 times x minus 3 quantity squared. Negative 1 over 3 times negative 9 is going to be positive 3. Without a calculator, I'm going to tell you 3 plus 4 is going to give you 7. I'm going to copy everything else. And we can now write down the vertex. So again, vertex is another way of saying, is it a maximum? Is it a minimum? Because it's going to open down. And how do we know it's opening down? Because it's a negative leading coefficient, which means it opens down. And if it opens down, this means it's going to be a maximum. Again, here's what it looks like, right? It opens down. So there's a maximum somewhere. The maximum is going to be 3 and 7. Now, the question is asking specifically, what is the maximum value? So let's be very clear about this. Let me grab a different color. Value means the y component. So this number here, 7, that is the maximum value. So again, in one sentence, the maximum value equals to 7. Now, here's how you double check. This is the shortcut that I have used many, many times. So if you like, you can use this approach or not. It's up to you. Now, here's a shortcut, everyone. There's a formula that you can use, and it goes like this. h equals to negative b over 2a, and this is how it goes. You go back to the question here, and you identify the values of a, b, and c. So again, just like the quadratic formula, you look at those numbers, a is going to be negative 1 over 3, b is going to be 2, c is going to be 4. To find the h value, h value is this value, by the way. When I say h, I'm hoping when it gets 3 in a moment. This is going to be negative b, so negative 2 divided by 2 times a, which is negative 1 over 3. So let's work this out. This equals to negative 2 divided by negative 2 over 3, and that's the same as negative 2 times 3 over negative 2, which is exactly 3. It should not be a surprise that we get the same answer. Now, of course, once you have 3, you could plug it back in to find k. So k just means you plug 3 back into the original question. And when you do that, you're going to get 7. So again, within a minute, if you apply the shortcut, you know you did it right. Example number 6a, verb problems. Find the minimum product of two numbers whose difference is 17. What are the two numbers? Let me grab a text box. Step one is write down a let statement. You can say something such as let x and y be two numbers. Let's here for you. So again, there are two numbers, and they're basically x and y. Now, from the first statement, it says the difference is going to be 17. So if you take one of them and you subtract the other one, that's going to be 17. Let me go back to the first color. And it says, what are the two numbers? And it says, minimize the product. So write down the word minimize. P, which stands for product in this case, is going to be x times y. So again, find a minimum product. Product means you multiply these two numbers, x times y, such that these two numbers, when you subtract them, it's going to be 17. So you can choose to isolate for x or isolate for y. I'm going to isolate for x, which will give 17 plus y. You can put a box around this. I'm going to plug it into here. Again, I would invite you to pause the video, plug this back in, solve for y by completing the square, then solve for x, and write down a final statement. When you're done, you press play again. I'll be here. Welcome back, everybody. So the product equals to 17 plus y times y. Now, there are many ways of doing this, by the way, but if we try to promote consistency, we're using completing the square, you can expand this. That's going to be 17y plus y squared. Or you can write it like this, y squared plus 17y. So 
again, we're going to complete the square. Notice the leading coefficients are 1. So you don't factor a 1. It's already done for you. You move on to the second step, which is taking this number, 17. You're going to divide this by 2. Then you're going to square this. So again, 17 squared equals to 289. And 2 squared is going to be 4. So you can add and subtract 289 divided by 4. And again, if you take the first trinomial, you're always going to get a perfect square. This is going to be y plus 17 divided by 2 quantity square minus 289 divided by 4. So this means, first of all, the leading coefficients are 1. So it opens up. And if it opens up, this means you're finding a minimum because it opens up. It looks like that. There's the minimum. So the vertex, which is a minimum, equals to negative 17 over 2, negative 289 divided by 4. Now, that is the y value. So y equals to negative 17 over 2. You can go back and find x. x is going to be 17 plus negative 17 over 2. And of course, in this case, that's 34 minus 17. That's another 17 over 2. So you can express this as a final statement. Let's grab another text box for you. Therefore, the numbers are, now if you want to leave it as a decimal, that's perfectly okay. So 17 divided by 2 is 8.5. So you can say 8.5 and negative 8.5 respectively. And let's put this here. Let's see if I can make this better for you. So again, therefore, the numbers are 8.5 and negative 8.5, respectively. Now, there's one more step, though, of course. Uh, they're asking what are the two numbers. But if you want to find the minimum product, so they're not asking only for what are the two numbers, but they're also asking find the minimum product. So the minimum product, of course, is right here. So this number, minimum product. E equals to negative 289 divided by 4. So again, you can grab a final statement. I trust that you can type that on your own. Example 6b, word problems, basketball. The path of a basketball shot can be modeled by the equation h equals to negative 0.125 d squared plus 2.5, where h is the height of the basketball in meters, and d is the horizontal distance of the ball from the player in meters. A, find the maximum height reached by the ball. So again, you can write down h equals to negative 1 point or negative 0 0.125 d squared plus 2.5. The first step is you want to factor uh, negative 0 0.125. So again, you can think of um, uh, the strategy that we did for completing the square. But if you really look at this carefully, there's no d. So if there's an empty parameter, zero, zero D in the middle. So if we're thinking, how do we um, find the maximum height? You want to put this in vertex form. But this is already in vertex form. So if I rewrite this for you, this is negative 0 0.125 times D minus 0 quantity square plus 2.5. So again, be mindful. Sometimes you do complete the square. In this case, this is already in vertex form. So when it says what is the maximum height reached by the ball, it's going to be 2.5 meters. So maximum, so let's write down two ideas here. The maximum, of course, would be 0, 2.5. Again, not to overstate this, why is it a maximum? Because negative means it opens down. And if it opens down, which looks like this, then there's a maximum. And the maximum height I'll use a different color for this. That's always the y value. So the maximum height in this example is going to be 2.5 meters. Let me just double check the units here. H is the height in meters. So that's part A. The maximum height is 2.5 meters. Part B, what is the horizontal distance of the ball from the player when it reaches its maximum height? 
So the horizontal distance, again, is the X component. So if I grab a different color for you, we're looking at this number right here. So the horizontal distance, I'll write down HD, which stands for horizontal distance, that's gonna be zero meters. So this is actually right at the beginning here. So the way you kind of graph this, it'll create that dual mindset and the graph and the algebra will match. So the horizontal distance from the ball, from the player, when it reaches its maximum height, it's gonna be exactly, it's gonna be exactly zero. Part C, how far from the floor is the ball when the player releases it? So how far from the floor? So you wanna find the height and you wanna find out um, when the player's releasing it. So let's go back to the beginning here. The path of the basketball shot can be modeled by this equation. So I would say in this case, your goal is to find how far from the floor. So you wanna find distance. Um, how far from the floor? Actually not finding distance because it says how far from the floor. You're looking for height. So how far from the floor? So imagine the floor is down here and it's asking how far from the floor. So there's some height that you're looking at. So it goes to find the height when the ball's releasing it. So you release this at time equal to zero, or I guess in the beginning when it's zero. So I think the answer is still gonna be 2.5. So this should be height at zero, which is gonna be negative 0 0.125 times zero square plus 2.5, which will give you 2.5 meters. Again, if you wanna write a sentence, a final statement, you could, but I think that is the answer. How far from the floor is the ball when the player releases it? Yep. Great start, great finisher. Example 6C, real problems, application. The radar detector of a lighthouse has a range that can be modeled by the equation x squared plus y squared equals to five. The lighthouse is located at the origin of a grid. A boat is traveling on a path defined by the equation x minus y equal to two. Will the boat be detected on the radar screen at the lighthouse? Explain. So before I start this question again, I'm inviting you to draw a diagram. If you can draw the circle, which is x squared plus y squared equal to five, and if you can draw x minus y equal to two, then you're more than halfway. So again, you can pause the video. When you press play again, I'll be here. Welcome back. So here's the first step. Draw a diagram. Now I'm gonna go back and look at the scale. I'm gonna pick three. So one, two, and three. This should be suffice for the sake of this example with the numbers that are given to us. So the first step is I look at the line x minus y equals to two. If x minus y equals to two, then that means I can bring negative y to the right, I can bring two to the left, or you can say y equals to x minus two. This is a great nine skill set. You go back to the y-intercept, negative two. You go back to the slope, which is one. You go up by one, right by one, up by one, right by one. You draw the straight line. So there it is, y equals to x minus two. Now in a different color, I'm gonna go back to x squared plus y squared equals to five. And you wanna be mindful, x squared plus y squared equals to five means you can find the radius. Remember, the general form is x squared plus y squared equal to something square. And the only way to express five as a perfect square is to express it as root five in brackets, square. So again, you can grab a calculator, you can do a little bit of mental math. If you think about the square root of um, five is approximately 2.2. So the radius is root five or approximately 2.2. So it's gonna be somewhere here. Again, it did say in the question that the origin is gonna be the center. So if you connect everything, it's gonna be something like that. Now, again, it's not a perfect circle, but this is gonna be x squared plus y squared equal to five. If we go back, the question is asking, will the bolt be detected on the radar screen at the lighthouse. So let's solve this. We're gonna go back and plug it in. So you can write down x squared plus y squared equals to five. You're gonna plug in y. So x squared plus in brackets, x minus two quantity squared equals to five. 
Now, before we solve this, I'm telling you right now, we're expecting two answers. One of them is going to be here, and the other one's going to be somewhere there, right? So again, we don't know what the answer is yet, but we're expecting two answers. So if expand this, this is going to be x squared plus x squared. If expand the perfect square, that's going to be minus 4x plus 4, which equals to 5. Again, bring everything to the left-hand side. So x squared plus x squared is going to be 2x squared minus 4x. 4 minus 5 is going to be negative 1. So again, at this point, you can choose one of three methods. You can use completing the square. You can solve by factoring. Or the one method that works every single time is going to be the quadratic formula. So again, a is going to be 2, b is going to be negative 4, and c is going to be negative 1. So if I go back to the formula, this time I'm going to go straight to the formula. Negative b means negative negative 4. That's going to be plus 4, plus or minus. b squared minus 4 times 2 times negative 1 divided by 2 times 2. Again, we can round this to one decimal place. So let's show you one more step first. So 2 times 2, of course, that's 4. If you think about what's in the square root, negative 4 squared is going to be 16 plus 4 times 2, that's going to be 8. That is the square root of 24. So I will reduce this for you to give you more skills. Then we'll go straight to the rounding. So let's create a bit of space for you. I really hope you've copied some of this in your notebook as you're doing it. Please do not eyeball this video. You really want to copy this and do this in real time. So if you think about the square root of 24, that's 4 times 6. So again, square root of 4 times 6 divided by 4. Let's make more space here. So x equals to 4 plus or minus 2 root 6 divided by 4 which means this is going to be, if you divide the numerator and the denominator by 2, that's going to be 2 plus or minus root 6 divided by 2. Now, if you round this to one decimal place, and I'm going to leave a bit of space because we're looking for x and y. We're not looking only for x, but x and y. 2 plus root 6 divided by 2, that's going to be approximately 2.2. I'm going to put a box around this. I'm going to come back to it. In the second case, if I take 2 minus root 6, divide this by 2, that's approximately negative 0.2. Now remember, your goal is to find both x and y. So if you kind of go back and you plug it back in, you can use this equation. And again, it's an approximation. So 2.2 minus uh, 2, that's going to be 0.2, which is an approximation. Likewise, if you look at the second case, if you plug negative 0 0.2 minus 2, that's negative 2.2. So the question says, will the boat be detected? And of course, the answer is yes. So let's write this in a text box. I'll erase some of this. And we'll talk about where it will be detected. So here's a text box. So yes, boat will be detected on the radar screen at the lighthouse at about 2.2, 0 0.2, and negative 0 0.2, negative 2.2, let's put the brackets back. There we go. I hope this makes sense.